You're listening to the best of the Martha Zoller Show. You can hear the show live Monday through Friday from 9 to 11 on AM 550 and FM 102.9 WDUN and streaming at accesswdun.com. You can find all things Martha Zoller at marthazoller.com. Welcome back to the Martha Zoller Show. We are now joined by Senator John Ossoff, and we appreciate him joining us again. Welcome, sir. Good morning, Martha. Thank you for having me. And uh, to everybody tuned in on the roadways, on the way to work, or just having dropped the kids off, uh, thank you so much for the pleasure of serving you. It's ossoff.senate.gov, however I can be of service. So let's first of all talk about what uh, happened yesterday related to veterans and the kinds of things we're trying to go forward on. I know this is something you've been working very hard on with Senator Johnson. Tell us about that. Martha, as you know, I led an eight-month investigation of the mistreatment of our military families who live in privatized housing on bases across the country, including Fort Gordon right here in Georgia. And the results of our investigation were appalling. We're talking about uh, serious mistreatment of service members, their spouses, and their kids. Vermin infestations, rats and cockroaches, mold and mildew that was severely, has been severely impacting the health of children in housing on post at Fort Gordon. Work orders never responded to, just neglect and abuse. And it's completely unacceptable. Military families already make such sacrifices in our defense. They should not have to sacrifice a safe and healthy home. And Martha, you know I got a 10 month old baby daughter. If it were imposed upon me to live somewhere with mold and mildew that was negatively impacting my daughter's health, and by the way, these folks are giving up so much of their autonomy to serve the country, it's an outrage. That was the investigation that I led. What I'm doing now is working on bipartisan legislation to get at this problem. And so I'm working with a group of Republican and Democratic senators uh, on this issue. And our latest initiative is to establish an oversight body that will report directly to Congress and the Secretary of Defense for military housing and which will be comprised of, in part, military service members themselves, including enlisted personnel. And I think that's the key. Enlisted personnel have to be part of this military housing oversight body because they are bearing the brunt of the abuse. So uh, this, are you getting good response from the Department of Defense, from Fort Fort Gordon, from the people that are involved, uh, recognizing there's a problem, owning up to it, and, and trying to fix it? Well, I've certainly got their attention. Uh, as, as you know, I chair the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, so I am the lead investigator in the Senate. And the hearing that we held after conducting this eight-month investigation, uh, I want to emphasize, again, bipartisan investigation. I know, you know folks out there uh, listening that it can seem like it's just fighting and bickering in, in the Capitol, uh, but in fact, there is bipartisan work going on. There should be more. And I'm working to bring together Republicans and Democrats to do what's in Georgia's interest and what's in the country's interest. This was a bipartisan investigation that I led. Republican and Democratic senators, Republican and Democratic staffs working together, coming to shared conclusions. And that gives it such weight when it's not just one side or the other, Martha. And then when we bring folks before the Senate, haul them in front of that that committee and demand answers, we certainly have their attention. But I think it's too soon to tell whether the Department of Defense is yet taking the steps necessary, and I intend to continue holding them accountable. You know, there's, unfortunately, in the last 10 years, there's been a desire uh, that if you're in power, you're fine with just working with people of your own party, and it both sides are guilty of that. I mean, I could I could list several examples. I'm sure you could, too. Mike, are you seeing, because you're new to the Senate, are you seeing that through your work, through the example that you're giving, um, that people are being more willing and that leadership is being more cooperative? Because there were instances 
where leadership said you can't work on a bipartisan matter way on X, Y, or Z. And again, it doesn't matter to dredge up a bunch of old examples, but we've got to change this going forward because we've got, and it's going to take leadership being in support of it in addition to people like Senator John Ossoff, the senior senator from Georgia. Well, Martha, this is one of the reasons that I am so grateful for the opportunity to represent a state that is politically diverse. Because the truth of the matter is that most members of Congress are in safe seats. And they don't have to think about the full range of views, perspectives, and experiences of their constituents because they know that once they get through their primary, they're going to be fine. I represent a state that is politically diverse with a wide range of views. And I represent everybody in the state of Georgia, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, or as we're seeing increasingly, choose not to affiliate with either party. There's a couple of things I think we really need to work on as a, as a country, as a people. The first is that our leaders need to be working together in the national interest. And that doesn't mean that we need to agree. In fact, I, you know, Martha, I think you agree with me that healthy disagreement uh, and a, a loud and vibrant and contentious democracy is is helpful in that it really tests ideas and forces people to make strong arguments. But it's when folks start using power for power's sake. It's when they refuse to work together, even when they know they should, because it doesn't suit some short-term interest. That's where folks have really gone astray. And I think, Martha, you've seen since I took office that I'm consistently working across the aisle building bridges to my Republican colleagues to deliver for the state of Georgia, not for one political party or the other. The second thing is at at the level of of just uh, every family in Georgia and all of us around the dinner table in our day lives, we've got to stop hating each other over politics. I mean, we can disagree on the issues um, without seeing each other as enemies. We're all Americans, and if we lose sight of that, then we're really in trouble. You know, I've uh, taken on uh, some responsibility helping with the Carter Center's Democracy Resilience Project um, because uh, through my relationship with Jason Carter as well as uh, other folks, they felt like they didn't have enough representation among conservatives. And ironically, in the first phone call I had with them, I pointed that out to them that, you know, one of the reasons why conservatives don't want to work with them is that they're the perception of the Carter Center is just a progressive organization that's a little bit negative towards conservatives. And even after saying that, they wanted to continue talking to me, which I was happy about. So tonight, actually, we're having a gathering at the Carter Center to kind of kick off this program that we're, we're putting together that we have Democrats and Republicans and independents working on. Uh, because I, like you, while I'm a strong conservative, I think my ideas are better. I think Republican ideas are better. Uh, I'm an American before all of that, and I want things to work well for Americans. Um, You were recently campaigning in North Carolina, and you acknowledge the fact that the two seats in Georgia have been a lot of the reason why certain things have been able to be passed in the Senate and that more work needed to be done. But you were able to find that balance, I think, in campaigning for your Democratic colleagues, which people would fully expect you to do but also not berating or putting down the, quote, other side. Well, also because, Martha, you know, some of the policy that we passed that I think will most benefit Georgia has been bipartisan policy. Uh, We passed the most significant strengthening of veterans' health care in decades, and we did that with Democrats and Republicans in the Senate. We passed an infrastructure bill, which will remove lead pipes from our drinking water systems, uh, expand broadband internet access into rural areas, uh, upgrade our seaports and our airports, with Georgia being such an important logistics hub, repair our bridges, and that had bipartisan support. And uh, another thing I'm working on right now uh, with Republican and Democratic colleagues is to push toward getting every U.S. Army service member, every soldier, the flame-resistant uniforms that they need to be safe from burns. We saw in Iraq and Afghanistan how devastating those burn injuries can be for service members. And yet we still do not, as a matter of course, issue the flame-resistant Army combat uniform to every soldier. 
Uh, I think that we should, and I'm working with Republicans and Democrats in the Senate to make sure that soldiers in Georgia and across the country are equipped with uniforms that, whether it's in combat or in training, can protect them properly from burn injuries. I'm also working with Republicans and Democrats in the Senate to uh, upgrade the Kings Bay Naval Submarine Base, which plays a vital role in our national security and needs new training and maintenance facilities. So, um, you know, and, and, and to your point as well, uh, I like coming on your program, Martha, because we always have a healthy and respectful exchange of ideas. And it's okay to disagree. My point isn't that we should all agree. I don't think that's your point either. Uh, my point is that there are opportunities to work together. We've got to put the national interest over partisan interest. And, and we shouldn't loathe each other because we see the world differently. We should try to find common ground. You know, years ago I interviewed former Representative John Lewis, and we were talking about the budget. You know, we were talking about not passing the budget on time. Funny thing. We're still talking about that, okay? But, he, you know, I said to him, I said, you know, you could probably list 20 things that you don't like about the budget. I could list 20 things I don't like about the budget. Probably not much about the list would be the same, but there might be two or three things that are the same and we could work on together. And his answer to me, I'll never forget, he said, as a partisan, Martha, you know, I'd have to push back against that. But you're absolutely right. Um, we could find some common ground and we could work up together on that. And, uh, you know, that's a moment I've remembered. I mean, it was one of my first interviews with him. I had talked, I talked to him many times after that. But uh, there was that opportunity. And he was a partisan. He worked hard. And you're, you're a partisan in certain ways. You work hard for your party. And that's okay. I work hard for my party. Um, but I think there's ways we can find common ground. Let's talk just for a moment about veterans' health care. Uh, and I know you've been working on that, um, too. And, of course, Senator Isaacson, before you, worked very hard on trying to get a little more uh, merit involved in how uh, they dealt with staff at the at the VA and that kind of thing. Is there progress being made on that? Well, not enough, uh, to, to be frank with you. Uh, I, uh, on pretty short notice, inspected the uh, Atlanta VA Medical Center last week. I think it's useful when senators drop in without a whole lot of forewarning. Uh, you know, so there's not enough time to sort of scrub everything and touch up the paint and tell everyone to be on their best behavior. I want to see what veterans are experiencing when they arrive. Um, and the wait times for appointments at the VA and also for community care referrals for things like uh, dentistry and uh Imaging, you know, folks who need an MRI because, God forbid, they may have a potential cancer diagnosis. Uh, veterans, particularly at that Atlanta VA, are having to wait for, in many cases, months for those referrals. So, no, I don't think that uh, there is consistent performance across the VA um, that is that that is living up to the standards we should expect for those who have made sacrifices in defense of our country, who uh, have deployed overseas in many cases, uh, and who deserve the very best when they return home. One of the things that we have gotten done in Congress is passing legislation to ensure that those Iraq and Afghanistan veterans who uh, were exposed to uh, toxic burn pits and other toxic chemicals um, uh, get the benefits that they need. We did pass that legislation. And to answer your question very directly, I think the answer is no. The VA is not a jobs program. The VA is there to serve veterans, and if there are VA personnel who are not living up to their obligations and not performing at a high level, uh, then they shouldn't be there. And especially we need to straighten out Atlanta. I mean, we got to tell the truth. That's where a lot of the problems are, and the Atlanta Medical, uh, the VA Medical Center um, has a lot of challenges, and I know you're working on those. I know I don't want to let you go without you making your pitch about people getting out to vote, so I just wanted to let you do that. Well, listen, uh, I encourage everybody to make a plan to vote. I recommend voting early um, and participating in our democracy. And um, w whether we agree on the issues, no matter how you see the world, please be a part of it. Make sure that your voice is heard. And let me just make sure that I state this again really clearly. This is this is your Senator John Ossoff. I work for you. I want to hear from you. I want to help you. I welcome feedback. I welcome criticism. I welcome suggestions 
uh, and I welcome opportunities to serve. It's ossoff.senate.gov. Please ask for help where I can be helpful. Please hold me accountable. Uh, please be in touch. Anything that my staff or I can do, there's nothing off topic or too small. We will do our best to help you. It's ossoff.senate.gov. Martha, thank you so much as always uh, for the discussion and the opportunity to address the people. And thank you for being with us today. It's local radio, and that's why you're listening. It's the Martha Zoller Show on AM 550 and FM 102.9 WDUN. It is the Martha Zoller Show. Rod Huey's here with me today. And joining me on the phone is the king of numbers, Gabriel Sterling. Uh, He is the COO for the Secretary of State's office. He became famous during the 2020 elections. uh, And now we see him a lot calmer talking about how great these turnout numbers are. Gabriel, how are you? I'm, I'm enjoying my new title of King of Numbers. I'm going to change it on my business card. <laughs> I now. know. I love it. Well, I'm so. queen of the world. You can be the king of numbers, right? <laughs> I'll take it. I'll okay. take it. So I, I looked at the numbers this morning. It is astronomical what we are seeing. Just give us a quick overview of where we are right now, and then let's talk about any issues or um, things that are going well, things that are are being improved on. Well, as you as everybody's pointed out, but the left doesn't want to admit we have numbers that are through the roof for a midterm. I mean, if you can compare where we are in total to 2018, at 2018 at this point, the third after the third day of in-person early voting, we had 225,015 votes. As of close of business yesterday, we had 396,332 in-person early votes. It's a 76% increase over 2018, which is, as you just said, it's cr- we're crushing it. I mean, statewide, the counters are doing a fantastic job of getting this high volume through. And this is really great work all the way around. I mean, and the, the fears and the fear mongering around the Election Integrity Act, we've been saying since it was passed in, 20, in 2021, this is not going to impede anybody's ability to vote. And reality is slapping the left in the face about this. Now, absentee ballots, that's really kind of where, and, and look, you know me, you've known me a long time. I've been saying since 2006 that we have issues around ID related to absentee ballots and that someday uh, someone was going to figure out how to drive a Mack truck through it. And it wasn't anything illegal, It, but the combination of of COVID and retiring poll workers and 30 percent absentee ballots or whatever it was just created a huge workload and we needed to work on how we did that um and i think that the election integrity act senate bill 202 closed some of those loopholes and made it more secure how are we doing on absentee ballots well the reality of it was you're right it was really a workload problem for the counties because of the sheer volume. They weren't built for it. So the state took over large parts of the um, uh, fulfillment of that. But this time, we're seeing Georgians kind of fall back to their normal, what they like to do. You know what Georgians like to do? They like to go vote in person. But even with that, we are already ahead. In 2018, there were 223,000 um, absentee ballots cast in the midterm general election. We are already at 230,000 requests, 229,000 ballots have been sent out. So we're going to surpass that. That's the left sort of fallback position. They said, well, everybody's early voting because they can't, they can't absentee vote, which again, we're about to set a record for that in the midterm. And it's not COVID times. We're going to fall back to like that 7% or so, but we've moved to that driver's license. So it's binary. So we can look at this thing and say, yes, you are the person you say you are. It's not like we're having to train a $10 an hour temporary employee to look at angles and, and loops on a signature to identify somebody. So <laughs> yeah. I think we've moved to a much better system. And Minnesota's been doing this for a decade. No one's suing them about it because they're because they're a Democrat state. We do it, and all of a sudden, it's Jim Crow 2.0 all over again. So how, are there any issues? What kind of issues have you dealt with so far with people needing help from the Secretary of State's office? Well, it's, it's the, we've seen a lot of the typical issues that we see, but now because of the tightness of the races, they're all kind of heightened. You know, poll watchers kind of getting in the way of things, um, in, improper assistance in the polls. Yesterday was a weird day. Um, <laughs> in Spalding County, we saw somebody try to slip a fraudulent ballot into the system. It was caught by the Spalding County elections workers. We have an investigation open. We backed that ballot out so it didn't get in. I think people are going to try to test the system more. And let me just give a warning to anybody trying to do that. It's a felony. If you think you're trying to prove a point, 
you can choose to take the risk of committing a felony, but I really recommend against it because our county elections workers and working with the state are looking at it really closely right now. Did Senate Bill 202 or have other processes made some of these investigations go more quickly? Because that has been a complaint in the past, too, that you have things that were brought in 2016 that weren't adjudicated till 2020 and vice versa. So has that been helped? Well, not exactly, because we saw the same number of investigators. The GBI has four investigators, but they are solely focused on the Coffee County situation right now. And we have now gotten about a full complement of investigators. We have 20 investigators for the entire state, and they're not just elections investigators. They're secretary of state investigators, so they have to go and investigate used car dealers and cosmetologists if they're doing stuff, and massage therapists. So they have all the other jobs, and we would love to have more investigators, but, but we don't. But we are really jumping on these things really quickly right now because we understand the um, importance of having people's faith kept up in the outcomes of these elections and oftentimes the investigations are done but they weren't presented to the scb because the scb the state election board wasn't prepared to hear them since secretary raffensperger got elected we cleared out a lot of that backlog and we were we've been working with the new state election board's chairman and and that board to clear out all the cases that we can because we fully anticipate we're going to have another round of claims and counterclaims investigations we have to do to present to the scb so are you um are you concerned about that, and will you be asking for more investigators? I know this is more of a Raffensperger question, but do you think in the next legislative session you'll be asking for more investigators? I will say this, Martha. Every single year we have asked for more investigators. We did get some um, the first year, I believe, but then when COVID came in, we had to do a 14% cut across the board, so we couldn't add anything. But that's true across the entire the entirety of state government. We were, we were preparing we were doing responsible conservative governance, um, and I, I think we will probably ask again. We may or may not get them because essentially they've looked at the four GBI investigators as, you know, they, they are solely dedicated to elections issues. So that, And this hasn't all been worked out. How do we do this? How do you hand things off? What rises to that level of criminality? The Coffee County situation obviously rises to that level of criminality, but they're not going to be investigating – you know, if a poll man, if a poll watcher was too close to a computer, you know, that's not really that, what they're going to do. But we have to do all. We have to investigate all of those and bring them all before the SCB if there's credible evidence of those. So, give people just a thumbnail description of the Coffee County because you mentioned it a couple of times. We've talked about it, but just what do people need to know about that? If Coffee County was a television show, it'd be a soap opera. I mean, <laughs> it started <laughs> off. They, they, I would, I've discovered in our few years in this job that there are counties that, regardless of personnel, seem to continually have issues, and Coffee County is one of those counties. Um, their elections director kind of did a YouTube video, showed one of her passwords for some of the elections processes in a YouTube video, mischaracterized the adjudication process, saying that she could change votes and do stuff, and that kind of kicked off us looking at Coffee County. We went down there. She had to change her password. She ended up getting fired not long after that. Um, because she was accused of falsifying her hourly records. And so, and that happened back in February. And then there was a cyber ninja card found there. And we called down to the new elections. He, he called us about, he found it. And there was a, a, a bulletin put out by the state and our voting vendor saying, you know, nobody's supposed to have access to your equipment, yada, yada, yada. And they called us. We had to send an investigator to talk to them. They said, we've asked everybody. We haven't seen anything. We're going to go into the former elections director's email with IT to see if there's any correspondence between them and Cyber Ninjas. There wasn't. And so that kind of stopped, and that was in May of 2021. Come February of 2022, in a lawsuit that was funded by Stacey Abrams, a woman named Marilyn Marks recorded a phone call with a gentleman named Scott Hall, who said they had imaged everything in Coffee County. She actually made that recording in March of 2021 and sat on it for a year. So then we had the server. We were investigating it. And through this process of investigation and through the lawsuit, because the lawsuit gave them subpoena power, they were, they were able to get through their discovery process. They were able to get a lot of these emails and the videotapes of everything of this actual uh, a company called Sullivan Strickler in coordination with Cyber Ninjas under the rubric of Sidney Powell was able to go in and image this equipment. We are still in the middle of investigation. GBI is taking it over because it's a criminal investigation because no one can access that and it's a computer crime. So that's kind of where we're at right now. 
I know it's long and involved. That's why I said it's kind of a soap opera. <laughs> it is kind of a soap opera. So what have there been problems in Fulton County? Have there been lines you can't handle? Have you seen any of that yet? Well, lines you can't handle is wildly subjective. If you go at lunch on the first day, guess what? You're going to stand in line. <laughs> so, yeah. Kind of like buying an iPhone on the first day. You know, you, you have to plan your vote and manage your time. So there are some locations there. I went and personally looked at the, um, uh, the Joan Garner library on Ponce, and they had about a 40-minute wait. And that's about an hour after lunch. But that's their second busiest one. Fulton County, obviously, is the biggest county in the state. They have 36 locations. And what's frustrating sometimes is in 2020 – they publish their wait times, and they have 36 locations. You could be in lo- there could be an hour long line in one location, two miles away there could be no line, but nobody can know that, but because they decided this year not to publish their wait times. Cobb County's publishing their wait times. Gwinnett County's publishing their wait times. Nearly everything's been under an hour, because during early voting, anybody can show up at any location in the county. Right. So there's right. no way to fully staff. It's not like you know. When a polling location on election day, you know how many people can come. You know how many machines you have to have. You know you have 12 hours to do it. So that's a lot easier to plan for. So we still have, what, 14 more days in Fulton County for people to vote. So anybody has a line, come back another time. Um, look at your thing. If you're really worried about lines, you can do a no-excuse absentee ballot. You can keep on requesting that all the way through next Friday. Well, I tell you what, um, I am a weirdo because when I come up and see a line, it makes me happy uh, because (laughs) it means people are voting. So I know I'm a weirdo that way. Uh, My dad was a POW in World War II. Voting was very important to him. On the day of my 18th birthday, I got he I put on my Sunday clothes and he and I went to the voter registration office in Belvedere Plaza back in the day and <laughs> registered me to vote because that's what you did. And so I'm a little weird about stuff like that because I like lines. So, well, Rod, I like the you pageantry want, of it. Yeah, yeah, we I have one, one question things, from Rod yeah, sorry. Huey. Okay. Hey, how you doing, Gabriel? Good, how's it going? Uh, good, good, good. A uh, quick question. The The typical communities of color that you generally have the longer lines and you know that were lines of uh discussion and interest are you still seeing that or is that now more balanced out and if you are still seeing that why um we're seeing it in fulton county and dekalb county but it's not really long lines and this is the one of the it becomes an urban myth when you have these I, I, on twitter people from california california talking about eight hour lines early voting and the Democrats have done a really hammered home on this. If you listen to African American radio, they've been talking about voting in October, which, as from election administration point of view, I love. I want everybody to vote in October so that election day is smooth. Um, but they have to manage it. So we see some of those things. But Fulton, they're being aggressive. They have 36 locations. DeKalb has 16 locations. Clayton County, which is nearly, I think it's 87% African American, they've already surpassed their entire 2008 turnout for, for pre election voting. So Everybody's taking advantage of these tools, but it's next to impossible to fully plan because of everybody being able, allowed to go to any location. Now, they know some of the bigger locations. Buckhead's a big location. Joan Garner Library's a big location. Um, East Point's a big location. And they've added more equipment and more personnel. But counties run these elections. They make those decisions. Um, I know sometimes they'll see if they have a heavy load in one of these locations, They'll move extra equipment and personnel from locations that don't have as much. But it's difficult to do that. In Fulton, they have these giant, you know, carriers. they got to get on drayage trucks and get stuff. You can't just on the fly, hey, we're going to move eight machines over here because there's limited space in these locations. The Joan Garner location, it's I think they have like ten machines going or eight machines, and they have a limited stop, spot in the corner because it's an active library. So there's re- the reality of these things is there's never a perfect way to do this, but I would stack up Georgia against nearly any state in the union for voter experience and speed of voting in the, in the reality of things. On election day, that's when you're really worried about lines because that's your last day. And if somebody has to leave the line, then they could be disenfranchised from voting. But during the 19 days of early voting in Fulton, DeKalb, and Cobb, and Gwinnett, you just got to plan. You got we got weekends to do. And we have so many hours. There's literally, whatever, 10 times 19, 190 hours, I think, of time or 170 hours of time. People can pick and choose when they need to do this. And guess what? There's a responsibility that lies on the voter to get it done. And they can choose, if they don't want to stand in line, to get a no-excuse absentee. And there's still plenty of time to do that as well. 
Well, Gabriel Sterling, I appreciate very much um, you being available. And do, you know, if people do have questions, how can they get them to you? Oh, gosh, there's a easy thing is contact at sos.ga.gov. Um, you can go to our website. There's plenty of information all over the place on that, and that's at sos.ga.gov. But I want to leave you all with this. If you really want to plan your vote, the most important thing for, for voters to do is to go to MVP, my voter page, dot SOS dot GA dot gov. Find your polling location. Make sure you're registered in the right place. Make sure the information is correct. And plan your vote for you and your family and what's best for y'all. Absolutely. Gabriel Sterling, thank you so much for your time today. Well, thank you, Queen of the World, Zala. I appreciate it. <laughs> That's right. The king of numbers. Putting the talk in news talk. It's the Martha Zoller Show on AM 550 and FM 102.9 WDUN. It is the Martha Zoller Show. Rod Huey's here with me. And Steve Moore is back. We are so happy to have him back on the program because it's the economy, stupid. Uh, everybody's <laughs> talking the economy, whether it's Herschel Walker in his debate, Brian Kemp in his debate, and every person <laughs> on the street. That's what they're talking about. Yeah, Martha, this is not going to be a complicated election, right? It's pretty clear that the uh, the economy and inflation are issues number one and two, and number three is crime. And then you have to go down a lot now to get to inflation. Then way, way, way down at about 1% is climate change. <laughs> so I think the people in Washington think climate change is the most important issue, and, and most Americans rank that about the, the least mo- important issue right now. Incidentally, I saw an amazing poll by a liberal group, by the way, uh, Martha, Martha, and what it found, it was a poll of African-American women. You know what the number one issue for African-American women is? Crime. No. No, what is it? Inflation. Okay. Prices. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, you know, crime was, I think, third on that list, Martha, but inflation was the biggest uh, concern that black women have. So, you know, I think if you're concerned about inflation, you may not want to may not want to vote for the Democrats, right? And by the way, we're, there's a real buzz around about how well Herschel performed in that debate against Warnock the other day, and really just clobbered him. Yeah, I think that. Well, in fairness, Warnock had big expectations. Herschel's expectations yeah. were fairly low, but he came right. in with a strong message. And I think you he can did. walk you can walk away from that debate and know what Herschel Walker's message was. Exactly. Warn- Warnock is like Biden, and oh, that's Washington. He said that several times. When you that's ask what message. Senator Warnock's message was, he was kind of all over the place. I think he was yeah. surprised. Yeah. And I think he was, I just watched some of it, but I, I like the fact that, uh, look, th- I'm not a rah rah Republican. You know that about me, Martha. I mean, sometimes the Republicans are just as bad as the Democrats, but it is important to me that people who did this to our country get ousted out of office. <laughs> you know, Warnock has spent and borrowed, and he's been the key vote. Without Warnock, we wouldn't have $4 trillion of additional debt. He is individually responsible for this. And so, you know, if, he should he should be back in the private sector. He should not be in a position. And I, I thought that uh, that uh, Herschel was very strong on that message of the massive amount of, of debt. And I love this comment by Warnock saying about inflation. You see, I'm sure you saw he said, oh, well, we're bringing insulin prices down. It's like. Are you? Have you been to the grocery store? Have you been to the gas pump? Have you? Are you so out of touch? You know, the Inflation Reduction Act didn't reduce inflation; it increased inflation. So, as we look at the economy over the next yep. three or four months, um, because it's going to take some time to turn this around, um, even yep. if we get everything we want in November. Yes. Um, yep. What What are you predicting? What are you seeing as we go forward? What do people need to prepare for? Well, you know, it's funny you should ask because I was just writing my weekly column on what should Republicans, because the Republicans are going to win the House. It's, a, you know, for sure. That's a 95% certainty. It's a, a real question about, you know, the Senate is still kind of up for grabs. That's why everybody's looking, watching Matt Warnock and, um, and, uh, Herschel Walker race. But the priority number one has got to be to, um, to, uh, stop the funding of those 87,000 IRS agents. That, that was, is outrageous. Um, they're going to be knocking on everyone's door. You know, everybody's going to have to go through these crazy audits. It is uh, a, an abuse of power, especially when we don't we don't have enough 
border security agents. We don't have enough people in the Army. We don't have enough people police. We don't have enough firefighters. And they want to hire 87,000 IRS agents. So that should be priority number one. Number two, and probably just as important, is to call for an immediate reduction in government spending. And I would call for, uh, you know, I've been talking to Kevin McCarthy and Steve Scalise about this. Why don't you do a 10 or 15 percent across the board reduction in, in every government agency? Because these these um, agencies are so bloated with money right now. I mean, Biden, is, as I said, four trillion dollars, a lot of money. <laughs> so yes. let's get, let's capture, bring some of that back. And that will help bring inflation down. And I think it will also inspire confidence that our financial situation is not completely out of control, because that's what most Americans think. And they're right. Right now, I've never seen anything like this. Four trillion dollars in 18 months. So speaking of you're not a rah-rah Republican, um, (laughs) uh, my concern is, while I want to get back at people just as much as the next person does, I don't want a new Republican Congress to just be focused on a bunch of hearings about things that have already been dealt with. Mm -hmm. I... I, and it's not that I don't think many of the things are important, whether it's Hunter yeah. Biden or whatever yeah. it is. Uh, I just want them to be focused on the economy like a laser beam. They're going to win the House because of the economy. So they need to focus on fixing it. Yeah, I would. I agree with that generally, although I do say and I look, I don't want a hundred different investigations. But the one thing that does need to be investigated, in my opinion, Martha, and it's related to your point about the economy. What happened to the three hundred, four hundred billion dollars of fraud payments and the and the fact that uh, so many erroneous payments, the unemployment program and the uh, food stamp program and Medicaid program, and you know I'm not talking about three hundred million. I'm talking about three hundred billion with a B of of fraud. And the Democrats have not wanted to investigate that. They don't even want to find out what happened. And I think you got to do something about that. It's where North Georgia comes to talk. It's the Martha Zoller Show on AM 550 and FM 102.9 WDUN. Yes, if you can get the question. Any of the people behind you, have they received victory notices? And if so, do they speak to us? Uh, no, we want you to go ahead and see the people behind us. That's the reason you're here. I hope you're going to go ahead and see the people behind us. That's the reason I brought you down here. You were here in Atlanta, and you have not come down to see this. So I brought you down here, so now you can go in and see the people right here. I hope you got to go in. Are you going to do that or no? No, are you going to do that or no? Yes, but... Oh, you're going to go in. So that's, what, that's the reason I brought you here. I brought you here to go down right here, walk over right here, I walk over and visit the people, and we want to make sure you visit the people here. It is the Martha Zoller Show, and uh, that was Herschel Walker, and joining me on the phone right now is Senate candidate Herschel Walker, and he showed a light on a story that people should care about, okay? Raphael Warnock has has gets a stipend from his church his church rents out these apartments and there are problems related to how they're handled that are resulting in lawsuits herschel walker welcome back to the program how are you hello there how are you doing thank you for having me on god bless you thank you and i tell you what we're blocking and tackling all the way to november 8th and uh friday was a very good night for you uh you Uh, you did a t- fantastic job. It was a good night. Uh, it was a good night for my team because, you know, we studied. And uh, I hope people see now that I'm ready to uh, serve them very first day and they can get it out of their mind that Raphael Wondock got exposed for who he is and what he's about. He's not for Georgia, that he's for Joe Biden, that I'm here for Georgia. And I hope people see that uh, all the things that they've been saying has been a lie. You see who's the wolf is sheep clothing right now because uh, I think he got exposed, as I said early on, and I hope people see that. <laughs> now, it's been a tough couple of weeks, I'm sure, for you and your family. Um, it, there's, you know, first of all, how's your family doing? Because uh, everyone doing well. They're good. doing well, and that's, it, and that's what's so funny. My family are very resilient. They are very they are Christian-based, and God is always good to us. So, um, 
how has it been though the last couple of weeks having to answer all these questions over and over and over again about things that have happened so long ago? Well, it, it's been tough, but you know I, I've been very transparent, and I've been very transparent, and I said, guys, this election ain't about uh, my life, and I didn't want to make about his personal life because he's hidden everything about what he's done. And that's what people don't want to know about. They don't want to know what he's in. And I'm not going to go into it now. And even yesterday, uh, you know, they brought up what was happening in these apartments. They brought it up during the debate. And I found out about it that day. And he blamed me that I had something to do with uh, bringing this out. And I didn't, which was a lie. And then he brought up Dr. King's name, man, because he got cornered. And I thought that was not right as well. Dr. King has nothing to do with this. And it's him that was doing it. And I think he showed the person he was. He would not take responsibility for anything, not take responsibility for, for what he's done to this, this state, what he's done to, to this country by his voting record. And I wanted people to see that. And then he got to the point he wouldn't even answer any question. And he's the incumbent senator. So it's like you need to answer questions. And, you know, all I've heard before the debate that he was going to destroy me. And I never, I never doubted that I was going to win this debate because I know who I am. But I think people see that he's not sure who he is right now. Yeah, I have noticed that he is deflecting whenever he gets asked a question uh, about any of his finances. He goes, you can't attack Ebenezer Baptist Church, the church of Dr. King and John Lewis. Nobody's attacking Ebenezer Baptist Church. What they're saying is, are you running Ebenezer Baptist Church in an appropriate way? And what is your responsibility in that? I think that's fair game. That's very fair game, but to him, it's not fair game. It's sort of like you're attacking a, a two very, very prominent black figures that was that had done some incredible things for this country, for the state of Georgia. But no, we're attacking you. We're attacking your record and your voting record. We're attacking what you have done. And, you know, and that's outside of what he's done as a senator. And I, that's why I said this is not a personal battle here. This is about what you are as a senator, if you can be a senator for the state of Georgia, and I hope people saw that I could be a senator for the state of Georgia because I will represent the people. I know how to vote. I know about what's going on with, uh, with policy. When people are saying I didn't know, well, I do know. And I've known the whole time, and I'm ready now to represent Georgia, to speak for Georgia and to fight for Georgia. So you're on a bus tour going around the state. Tell us what you're hearing from people as you talk to them and listen to them. You know, people are talking about this economy. You know, this economy, you know, it is it is, it is, is terrible. Right now, you know, people are afraid because, uh, you know, uh, they're afraid with what's happening with Joe Biden right now. You know, they see him begging for gas. And now they see that he's using all the reserves. They're putting us in a, 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 a crisis. And at the same time, crime is up. When we have our elected official, like Senator Raphael Warnock, that believe in no cash bail, not holding uh, criminals responsible, putting them out on the street, making us prisoners in our own home, and then they have an excuse for it. They're telling us this is a new normal, the new normal. Well, this is not the new normal. What is happening is we've elected people to office that don't have the guts to hold people in jail for, what, for their uh, crime and don't have the guts to go out and get our domestic energy and to get people back to work. Because that's what I said we have to do. We got to get this economy stirred up. We got to get everything moving again. Well, this has only been not quite two years. We see where we're at. Not quite two years where we're at. And right now we got six more years that they're asking for. And I do not think that we can recover from that if we give them six more years. If you're elected to the United States Senate, what are going to be the first things that you do? You know, one of the first things I like to do is try to get our energy uh, back, become energy independent back, because I think that disturbs a lot of things. You know, one of the things, not just talking about gas and oil, we're talking about farming. We have to get out, you know, farming is a large industry here in Georgia. We got to get our farming back together. And then you talk about a lot of other things that are involved. Right now, we're coming down to winter. You know, it's starting to get cold. What are we going to do about our uh, utility bills? People wait to get their utility bill. That's going to be extremely high. And I think they can also put jobs back into uh, this, this economy, put jobs back into it, and that's what we got to get done. And then we got to secure this border. This border is out of control. People are coming across this border. We have no clue who they are. Crime is coming across. Drugs are coming across. You know, fentanyl, and I mentioned it before, 10 tons of fentanyl has already been caught at the border. 
10 tons of fentanyl that can kill every American 13 times over have been caught at the border. But yet, think about what has not been caught. And I warn all our mothers and fathers that have kids during this holiday period, they're dressing fentanyl up to look like candy. We have a new war. China has brought a new war to us, and we need to recognize that China is not our friend, that we need to come together as a people of the United States of America, get our military back together, get our law enforcement back together, and be a strong country like we always have been. So, Herschel Walker, you heard it here, folks. He's the three priorities, energy independence, getting the economy back on track, and controlling the border. That sounds like the things that you care about. Uh, I've been working over this past week helping people get the vote out. I know Herschel is doing that. People, um, you've got to get out and vote. If you, Herschel said this on an interview, the first interview I did with him, one of his, one of the things he said is if you don't vote, you can't change things. And a lot has happened since then, but that is true. Herschel Walker, if people want to help you, how can they do that? Well, they can go to teamherschel.com and at the same time continue to pray. We want to have prayer. Uh, you know, the last filing is going to be, uh, this coming Wednesday, well, today going to be tonight if you can contribute get out of door knock get people out to vote vote for herschel walker because i can promise you i'm going to fight for georgia i've scored for georgia before and i'll score again we cannot put up with senator one out for six more years because we know he's a rubber stamp for joe biden and if he's not a rubber stamp for joe biden he has no clue of what he's doing because why did he vote with him 96 percent of the time well, I tell you what, even the mayor of Savannah, when he did his interview after your debate, he was asked about that. And he said, oh, he's not just like Joe Biden. He's only like Joe Biden, 96 percent. And I thought, well, even even the mayor of Savannah is got the talking point. So I thought that was good. Well, it, it is so it is so funny, Martha, that as I talk to a lot of reporters and I thank you for all you do it, they seem to be campaigning for Raphael as well. They always defending him. And I'm like, I'm not here to defend him, not to put him down. I'm here to fight for the Georgia people. The Georgia people are the one that's hurting right now. They're the one that got to go to the grocery store or the, or the fuel pump to pump their gas. They're the one that got to get jobs. They're the one, and we, we've forgotten about the baby formula. You know, they haven't got that uh, cleared up. In less than two years, we got a shortage of baby formula. Let's, let, how, could we, how could that happen? Excellent. And it's because the people we put in Washington. Herschel Walker, thank you so much for being with us today, and good luck on the campaign trail. Hey, thank you, and God bless. To hear the full versions of last week's Martha Zoller shows, go to the podcast page at accesswdun.com, and you can follow me on social media at Martha Zoller.